Welcome to Conversations with Dr. Skip Mason. Pastor, preacher, historian, author, teacher, librarian, archivist, world traveler, collector, family historian, avid reader, and creator of the popular Vanishing Black Atlanta Facebook page. But a lot of folks who love history. Most, Most importantly, he's our, he's our dad who loves his family and who taught us the importance of our history and having important conversations. Join him now for this episode of Conversations with Dr. Skip. Well, good Sunday evening, my brothers and sisters. I am so delighted to welcome each of you here today to this uh, special uh, afternoon gathering with some of the members of the College of Bishops of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, I am Skip Mason, uh, and I trust and pray uh, that you had a wonderful uh, and spirit-filled worship experience, whether it was virtual or in-person. Uh, and I'm just delighted that you have gathered here today. I know this is a Sunday afternoon. Uh, it's a football day uh, for those of us uh, like uh, my Bishop Thomas Brown, we just watched our Falcons uh, lose a game. Uh, and so we pray that your team will win, that there will be a victory today for somebody's team. But I'm so glad that you have gathered with us. I'm excited uh, and honored to have uh, our distinguished bishops with us today. Uh, and I'm going to bring them up uh, in just a moment. Uh, but before I do that, uh, yesterday, the Commission on Archives and History uh, had a wonderful uh, webinar uh, in which many scholars uh, and persons who are interested in the preservation of the history uh, of our church, uh, authors uh, as well, gathered uh, in a webinar uh, that was sponsored by the Commission. And we are so grateful uh, to all who gathered. I want to mention that on this coming Saturday, uh, we will continue with the second webinar, and let me put that information up, uh, which will be moderated by the church historian, Dr. Raymond Somerville, Remembering Our Past, Telling Our Story. Uh, and this is a workshop that will help, we hope, church historians and pastors and others build and maintain your church archives. Uh, and I'm excited about it. Our commission chair, of course, is our senior bishop, Lawrence Reddick. He may speak about it. Bishop Walker was uh, also a part of it yesterday. Uh, the moderator is Dr. Somerville. And of course, uh, I'm a part of it uh, next Saturday, as well as Lynn Hargrove uh, and Jermaine Marshall. So please join us. Go to the church's uh, website uh, to register for uh, that webinar. And normally I would thank all of the uh, the College of Bishops, Senior Bishops, my bishop and all of that. I get to, to say that to them personally and especially to Dr. Duhard, who continues to provide such tremendous support uh, to our church. Uh, before I bring the bishops up, I want to open up uh, with a portion of this prayer uh, from Reverend Dr. DeAndre Thurman from this morning's 8 o'clock a.m. service that I think will set the tone for what we hope to accomplish today. God, here it is 20 years later, and we find ourselves facing another enemy we cannot see. But God, you've been so good to us that you've allowed us to gather in your house just one more time. We wear masks now, God, but we say thank you. We have to wash our hands now, God, but we say thank you. We take vaccines now, God, but we say thank you. Because in the midst of it all, as Isaiah read your word, we cried unto you and you heard our voice. What a joy and a blessing it is to greet the distinguished members of the College of Bishops uh, of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church today. Uh, let me uh, present to you uh, Bishop Teresa uh, Jefferson Snorton, uh, who is the presiding prelate <coughs> of the fabulous 5th Episcopal District. Let me present to you Bishop Marvin Frank Thomas, uh, who is the presiding prelate of the 2nd Episcopal District. Let me present to you uh, my bishop, Bishop Thomas Lewis Brown Jr., who is the presiding bishop uh, of the sensational 6th uh, Episcopal District. 
Uh, I had to get that in because Barbara Cameron will text me if I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Let me present to you Bishop Kenneth Wayne Carter, uh, the presiding prelate of the 11th Episcopal District. Let me present to, uh, to you uh, Bishop Sylvester Williams, uh, the presiding uh, prelate uh, of the 3rd Episcopal District. Let me present to you uh, Bishop James Walker, the presiding uh, prelate uh, of the 7th Episcopal District. And last but certainly not least, let me present to you the senior bishop of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, Bishop Lawrence Reddick. Hello. Bishop, good evening, good afternoon to good all. Evening. Good evening. I, I'm, good evening. I'm so honored to, to have you here with uh, me today. Uh, and I know that there are a number of things that uh, you would like to share. Uh, and so we're going to certainly uh, move right into uh, our conversation uh, for today, our topic for today. And, and so, Senior Bishop Reddick, uh, would you please just uh, open us up uh, and talk about the College of Bishops uh, position on vaccines and the reopening uh, of our churches. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mason, for giving us this opportunity. If you don't mind, I'm going to start with uh, our, our, our emphasis for reopening, and, and I'm going to be expressive and grateful to the college that as we begin during the COVID epidemic back in March of 20. 20, I guess it was, uh, we asked churches about that time if they would to not meet in person, but to meet online and in other ways mm -hmm. in order to facilitate our people's health. And actually, when we were called upon to give names of people who had died during the pandemic in an ecumenical setting, I remember a presiding elder that said to me, we really need to thank you all because when I saw the names of people who had died in our churches, they were so much fewer than I'm aware of in some other churches in our areas. And so we did it then as a means to try to facilitate people's health. We are looking now also at the health of our congregations as a whole, and as well as, as the health of our people. And we believe we need to reopen because worship is vital to our lives as Christians. And many people are not as comfortable worshiping online and in other settings as they are uh, in person, but also because we have the vaccinations now. And we are very positive about the vaccinations. We want the people of the CME Church to be vaccinated. We believe the vaccination is a part of God's gift to us in the wisdom of those who have been able to create it. And we believe that persons who are responsible will want to be vaccinated unless their health forbids them. So we're very pro-vaccinated, vaccination. And um, I think I answered both of your questions or did you? Did I need to follow up? No, I, I think you did, Bishop, and I appreciate that. And I know uh, that there is an official statement uh, that is going to be released today. And I will ask uh, the secretary of the college, Bishop Jefferson Snowden, if she would like to uh, share that statement on behalf uh, of the college. Certainly, Dr. Mason. Uh, and again, thank you for this opportunity. This is the College of Bishops of the CME Church's statement and guidelines for responsible reopening of local churches. As your chief pastors, we express thanks to our pastors and churches for the stellar efforts you have and are making to adapt to this ongoing pandemic. You are to be commended for having chosen some very creative <laughs> online presences, offering worship, study, fellowship, and ministry of your congregations and the larger community. Because of your efforts, the CME mm -hmm. banner has been extended to multiple audiences in ways we had not previously reached. However, we as the College of Bishops believe it is now time for us to responsibly prepare for the reopening of our churches for worship and for ministry using best practices 
to seek to mitigate infections from COVID-19 and its Delta variant. Thus, we offer the following statement and guidelines to our Zion. First, all decisions about reopening should be based on accurate information on the status of the virus in your local community. Second, we urge all pastors and members to get vaccinated and to take the booster shot when appropriate and to continue to follow the guidelines of the Centers for Disease Control the CDC, and other reputable sources in the medical community. Third, we are recommending that by October 3rd, 2021, all local churches will prepare a reopening plan for their church facilities. Pastors, officers, and members should be in dialogue to develop the plan for in-person worship, prayer, study, fellowship, meetings, and funerals. Local health authorities should be consulted in developing the plan. Online and outdoor opportunities for worship and other activities should be continued or added. The process of reopening church facilities demands intentional prayer, physical preparations, and vigilant efforts to mitigate COVID-19 infections among all who enter our facilities. Therefore, for churches that are reopening or for those that have already reopened, these basic guidelines should be followed. All gathering places, sanctuaries, fellowship halls, bathrooms, classrooms, microphones, pews, pulpits, choir seating, musical instruments, and so on, should be carefully cleaned and sanitized prior to and ongoing as persons enter our church facilities. Next, if your facilities have been closed for a long period of time, perform a test on the water to ensure it's safe to drink and the ventilation system should be checked and cleaned. Next, all attendees regardless of vaccination status, must wear masks, wash hands appropriately, and practice social distancing when seated or standing, and avoid unnecessary physical contact. Each church should use temperature gauges to monitor persons attending worship gatherings. Attendance should be taken should there be the need for any future notification. We urge worship and gathering events be limited to a maximum of one hour and exit the building promptly after the service ends. We encourage you to feel free to consult with other pastors and churches. Take advantage of the opportunities to learn from one another and let's hold each other accountable while supporting others. Furthermore, we ask that all pastors keep their presiding elders and their bishop informed of their ongoing efforts to navigate through this crisis field time. And for our congregations in Mother Africa, Jamaica, Haiti, and beyond, we are aware of the problem of vaccine equity and have raised the issue of equal access to our leaders in Washington, DC. The CME Church firmly believes all countries, regardless of wealth, must have access to life-saving vaccines. Further, in the absence of equal access to vaccines, your diligent efforts in enforcing the wearing of masks, social distancing, and sanitation of hands and facilities has preserved life and stand as an example to all of us as we plan for a safe return to our facilities. Respectfully, the College of Bishops, the CME Church. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bishop Jefferson Snorton. 
Uh, this is certainly uh, a game changer. Um, might, might I ask uh, you uh, or any of you, uh, was there a lot of deliberation uh, in coming to this decision um, as you've come and as you've shared today? Um, and in that same vein, uh, what, what about those pastors who have decided that they choose not to take the vaccine or, or, or the, is there any immunity uh, for them? Uh, we know how our Bishop, Bishop Brown feels about that. He shared that with us on yesterday, but just give the church um, a little understand of how you all came to this decision. I anyone who would respond to that, please. Well, prior to a response, I did want to say that that statement in full will be posted on our website yes. and our social media uh, outlets, and it will be sent out through CME Communications uh, immediately after this program, as well as published in the Christian Index. So everyone will have access to the full text. Okay, great, great. Now I'll let somebody else do the other part. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Dr. Mason, yes, Bishop Walker. Uh, you you asked, was there um, was there conversation? I, I will say it like this: uh, one of the most important conversations to take place has been happening actually outside of the College of Bishops, mm -hmm. and it's an ongoing conversation. It's a conversation taking place in concert with a program called Trusted Voices. And uh, that is um, funded by a grant through the CDC uh, for um, the um, Council of National Black Churches, of which the CME Church is a part, uh, Bishop, uh, Senior Bishop uh, Reddick, uh, Bishop Brown and Bishop Thomas and Miss Faye Crowder Phillips um, represent the CME Church in, in that group. And what I will say is a conversation has been taking place then with pastors um, to put forth <laughs> trusted voices, uh, to offer or to train people in trusted content so it can be delivered in the church, which is a trusted space. Right. And uh, that has been a helpful and ongoing conversation we have as the uh, denominational coordinator uh, for that uh, program, Dr. Richard Watkins, who is a virologist, um, who uh, is a person who has gone uh, to school and still maintains a personal uh, relationship with Dr. Uh, Kismikia Corbett, uh, yes. the person who originated the Moderna vaccine. So what we have is, I would say, the highest caliber of uh, a knowledge base to offer to members of the CME church to have the readiness uh, and uh, to put together a plan mm -hmm. and to deal with what it takes to get back in our congregations in a responsible way. Well, you know, I knew of course that you all had much deliberation, support and, and consultation uh, in this, but how do you deal with you know, pastors and congregations who are still skeptical. You know, now we see people filling the mall and restaurants and the Falcon Stadium, though they lost, was filled to capacity. You know, so how, how do you deal? Well, of course, as an Episcopal leader, I'm sure there's a way of dealing with that. But for those pastors that may be skeptical about this thing, what, what do you offer? to them? Is that something that the church offers to help them to some understanding of the necessity and the importance of this? And getting the churches back open as well? Well, I think it's important that um, we continue to encourage people to be informed. It's the lack of proper, accurate information that leads people to make uh, draw certain conclusions that may not necessarily be in their best interest. Um, so, so in the Fifth Episcopal District in particular, we've just tried to push out information every time we have it uh, through our presiding elders to keep people informed, to make people aware 
uh, of what's happening in their particular area or in the state as a whole. Uh, our vaccine rates here in Alabama in particular are fairly low compared to the national average. And, um, you know, Dr. Mason and, and to my colleagues, I don't know what it's going to take to convince people who are still uh, reluctant. I, I don't really understand the hesitancy. I am just really exhausted with uh, getting calls and information about people who have died from COVID. Mm -hmm. I got two phone calls this morning of one pastor and a member. And, um, you know, we as the church have to value the life that God has given us. And I think right now, uh, for me, what's really important is that we help our people not be reckless because they're relying on inaccurate information. Because I think it's reckless uh, to expose oneself to a virus when there's a way to prevent it. May, may I briefly chime in? Yes, Steve. Um, my, my wife's pastor probably opened up about March, maybe February on warmer days. We had some real cold days then, but as soon as it was warming up, he encouraged people to come and meet on the outside in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And he really opened up with the announcement that the service was for people who were vaccinated. Right. And he urged the others who were not vaccinated to continue to watch online. So he was doing both at the same time. Mm -hmm. And as time went on, they began to meet inside, again, urging people that the inside service is for those who are vaccinated. I've watched people coming back and I've seen the congregation strengthen. Uh, I think the key word today is that we are asking people to plan mm -hmm. a reopening, to, to consider what the, what the possibilities are, whether it is a service in the parking lot, as many churches are doing, right. or to have inside service, social distance, as many other churches are doing, mm -hmm. and whether to make that kind of announcement that it is for those who are vaccinated uh, I wondered at first how that would go over, but I, I visited that church several times and it seems to go over well. well. On the other hand, one of the things I've seen is going to visit CME churches where the building is closed and yet across the street, another church is open and the parking lot has many people there. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, there's no announcement on the door that says we are worshiping on Zoom. It is it is as if they've gone out of business. That's what they're communicating to the community. And we're concerned about the message we are also sending to people about how we want to still reach them and we want to be used of God to bless them. Indeed, indeed. Yes, uh, Senior Bishop. Yes. Please. I'm sorry. Um, Brown, please go right ahead. Let me, if I may chime in on this, um, and I think uh, the esteemed secretary spoke to this that I'm addressing as well. Uh, my experience is that most pastors who are hesitant about taking the vaccine uh, are not open to dialogue about it. They are simply sharing what their position is. Uh, and uh, some of it has to do with biblical and some theological ramifications that they base their their um, stance on. Uh, out of this college, I don't know I've <clears throat> any of my colleagues, but I've taken perhaps some radical stances where I've just said to some pastors that uh, since you're not going to get the vaccine, then you don't need to be pastoring at this time. Uh, and uh, I, I don't like make, taking that stance. Uh, but I just think there's no way that a pastor can do his or her job in times like these when he or she is called to be there for the people and uh, he or she does not take the lead in doing what needs to be done to make sure that there's safety. Uh, I think that's not only reckless, it is, it is, it is theologically uh, irrational uh, to think that I'm going to be a shepherd and I'm not going to take the lead in this. Mm -hmm. So that's where I am, and uh, uh, that's not something I enjoy having to deal with, but but I think it's just that serious. Indeed, indeed. Anyone else want to chime in on that as well? Now, this is this is um, 
this is just um, um, uh, uh, a light spin, just a light spin. Uh, I was just thinking this morning about so much hesitance, and people saying that um, it was developed too fast. And then I realized it came to me that these are the same people who sing that he's an on time God. <laughs> yes, he is. And and so if if I mean so what what is on time? Yeah, if it's not on time, right? <laughs> Amen. Bishop uh, Thomas, I didn't see that one coming, but that is <laughs> it, it was on time. <laughs> it was on time, indeed, indeed. And and so it doesn't mean that you teach doing your Zoom, your virtual. You know, because most congregations have built up a tremendous virtual audience, you know, and so people are still tuning in at that time. Well, you know, I'm appreciative. Again, as you said, Bishop Jefferson Snow in the letter will be disseminated uh, and will be available uh, on the uh, the website. And there's a lot of support and conversation uh, in the comment section from from members. Many churches have already opened uh, West Mitchell. Uh, is doing parking lot services uh, once a month because we're having work done on the outside and the inside of the church. And those have been very effective. It puts us back on the church ground. People are able to see each other, you know, uh, and still practice safety uh, protocols. So uh, we, we applaud the college for uh, this move uh, in the direction that we're, that we're headed in uh, as well. What I want to do uh, is to just talk a little bit, uh, give you all uh, an opportunity to talk about what's going on in your particular district. And, and let me move this um, this logo from Bishop Walker's uh, face. There we go. But to talk about, uh, you know, any of the things, and, and, and Bishop Thomas, we're going to come back to you uh, and, and talk about uh, Cincinnati uh, in 2022. Uh, also, uh, Bishop Williams, we're going to ask you to talk to us about emergency response. And God knows we've had a whole lot of uh, uh, catastrophes uh, over the last few months, uh, if you will. But but please, uh, if you would, any, any highlights you got, a, you know, your your members are competing to get their names up on the screen during this uh, <laughs> event. Uh, and I can barely, <laughs> I can barely keep up, but I'm trying to do my best. But please, um, any highlights? You all of you have finished your your annual conferences. I guess you finished your annual conference. The last time I said that to Bishop Thomas, he was still having an annual conference. But um, and, and as you do that, how are your pastors doing? And your congregations? It, it's been rough on everybody, you know. So with this audience, just sort of give us an overview of how things are going as we head into this new uh, new year and as we head to the quadrennial. Anyone, please. Well, here in the Fifth Episcopal District, um, I think a majority of our churches and pastoral leaders have really stepped up and, and risen to the occasion. Uh, I've seen congregations who are not doing very much outreach really get involved, particularly around um, distributing food uh, earlier in the pandemic when there was so much food insecurity. Uh, I, I get so many uh, text messages. I've gotten on the list of several of my pastors text message list. So I get notices of when they're having Bible study and when they're having worship and all of those uh, different kinds of activities. And so I think everyone has done, done very well, but I, I am aware that there is a lot of compassion fatigue. Yeah. Uh, we've had a lot of death here in the state. Uh, our churches, I was just reflecting this morning, we have probably had more death during the surge of the Delta variant than we did last year. Oh, wow. During the original mm -hmm. um, the original outbreak of coronavirus. So the past several months have just been, uh, I think, one where our pastors have had to call on, been called on to, to conduct funerals and memorial services. And some of them have to have had to do that for their own family members. Some of our pastors and leaders have lost parents and siblings 
uh, I'm not aware of anybody losing a child, mm -hmm. but, uh, and, and several have just been sick. And um, often it's when one person in the house gets sick, everybody ends up being sick. Yeah. So there's just, I believe a, a lot of fatigue and I just want everyone to stay encouraged and see the opportunity as Bishop Thomas has said that God is giving us to do things a new way. Mm -hmm. uh, everything has changed. And as, as member, as leaders in the church, we have to be willing to change too. And that may mean working a little bit harder, working a little bit harder on Sunday to have in-person and, and online service at the same time, or working a little harder to, to conduct your meetings or having two services rather than one so that everybody uh, can gather safely. I think we just have to see this as an opportunity that God has given us to, to really be new creatures in Christ, reshaped by a, uh, reshaped by a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Anybody else would like to share? Well, let me just... Um, uh, Go ahead. Thank you. Um, let me just say the second Episcopal district, where indeed every second counts. Um, I mean, it, this this time has really been a blessing. I, I was just thinking of uh, of um, we went into a pandemic and and the church had no home. Uh -huh. Came out of pandemic and they have a home, a church building without a note. Uh, another church lost its home in the pandemic. And it's about to get a home, uh, and so I'm excited about that. And then I was uh, saw something pop up on Facebook. One congregation in, in Indianapolis just uh, got about five thousand bottles of water for a local school, and uh, so a number of our churches are doing so many uh, different things to be to be present and to be of service to their communities. And today and, and next Sunday, uh, uh, each each church choosing its own Sunday is is uh we do in the the middle of, of of september every year uh real pastors read sunday where pastors read to children uh and uh so it's not about the number given this moment but but and and they share those things on facebook so i'm just excited about about the way in which we have have uh um uh, recognized that this moment we did not ask for right it was the moment that god has built us for and prepared us for and so we are learning to respond to it. And so it excites me. And uh, I just thank God for the great people of the CME Church mm -hmm. and uh, in particular, the persons of the Second Episcopal District. Thank you. Bishop Williams, you were about to say. Thank you. First of all, let me join my colleagues in saying I'm delighted to be here. And thank you all for giving us this opportunity to share. And uh, even though I could have chimed in earlier relative to the um, the pandemic and, and of course taking the shots they had shared with you pretty much what I would have said. So I did not necessarily say anything, but right now, let me just say, I'm very much optimistic uh, about what is going on now in the third. I like my other colleagues and like persons, um, I had a lot of apprehensions, misgivings, if you will, when we entered into this season of the pandemic. But it has been amazing to me to see how the Lord has blessed even in the midst of it. And uh, some of the things that has come out of it, I, I just commend uh, the CME Church, but specifically, and as much as this is my area, may I say I commend the people of the third for their tenacity, for their zeal, and for how they have risen to the, uh, to the occasion. Um, one, of the, one of the things that, that we've done, sort of like everybody else, it has been amazing to see how even the churches that perhaps had not thought of uh, using technology may have thought even they were too small to do it or whatever the case was, but they had not even thought of technology. But now it is a primary source of their worship experience, of their staying in contact with each other, and uh, I, I just appreciate how they have been able to do it. Even if you allow me to see the annual conference level, uh, well, it's been amazing to me. expenses that, that I thought we were not going to be able to make. But I mean, even at the annual conference, when we start holding our uh, annual conferences via Zoom, 
I, I, I think my colleagues can agree with me. It has been a lot of savings that we've had in terms of spending money elsewhere. And needless to say, having been a part of several of our national meetings, we have seen the same thing that, that happened in terms of our national meetings. We just finished the Unity Summit, Connection to Board, and, and the like. But at any rate, I just wanted to want to say that uh, I want to be in church in general, and specifically the 30 fiscal district for how they have risen to the occasion and how they have started this year. Not they, we have started this year with a degree of optimism and looking forward to what the Lord is going to do and how the Lord is going to bless even as we go forward. But I think the primary thing that I just want to highlight is that we have really found different ways creative ways to uh, stay in touch and to uh, also meet the obligations. So for that, I'm just, I'm just grateful. And I just see the Lord doing more things for us even as we go forward. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Williams. Any other bishop yeah. would like to chime in and share, please? I want to comment briefly. Yes. I said briefly. <laughs> uh, I, I want to thank, I want to thank you and the other people who have led us as a connection, CIT, Dr. Duhart, who have led us as a connection into webinars and Zoom meetings, because a lot of us were either reluctant or not informed as well. And you've had patience with teaching people how to do things. And uh, so we, we are grateful to how you all stood up and helped make this possible. I want to thank all of the bishops because um, someone you, you had me laughing a moment ago when you said our annual conferences are over with. Yeah, the conferences are over with, but the conferences are not through with us yet. <laughs> they, they work us after conference is right. over. <laughs> but it's, it's been a joy to be able to do things and to see how faithfully the CME family pulls together. Uh, we still are a family and we still do pull together. I want to say on behalf of the Jamaican work that when, you, when you're in the non-US area, you have some different challenges. I know uh, probably uh, we have a few people online who try to get in to see your program from Jamaica. I know Colby Sims always does. Yes. But, but, but one of the challenges in going to the non-US area is you are under whatever new rules that country may have at that time. Amen. And one of, one of those is if I go into Jamaica, I have to quarantine a certain number of days. <laughs> and by the time that's over, at one point they told me if you were older than 65, you still had to quarantine after that time. And I'm older than 65, so. <laughs> uh, but I'm also going later in the fall to share with Bishop Omoite mm -hmm. in West Africa an annual conference. We're, I can't take vaccines with me, but through the help of CNBC and that CDC grant, I do plan to be taking some masks with me so that people will be able to be masked and social distance in the churches. And hopefully we can take some sanitizers too. But our work in the non-US areas, we must continue to be sensitive to because their regulations will be very different from ours. I think in Jamaica, only 20 people can meet in a church even now at a given time. Mm, wow. wow. Thank you. Anyone else? I'd like to piggyback on the senior. Yes. Bishop Carter. Well, as our theme in the 11th is a taste of heaven in District 11. But we've had some challenging moments, but we also have had some wonderful and awesome moments. And I can agree with uh, Dr. DeAndre Thurman, what he said, but we say thank you, Lord, for as well as it is. I just want to kind of share with it. It is very difficult in the foreign areas because many of our churches have been closed down by the government for a period of time and reopened and closed and reopened. And it's very difficult to travel because every time you get on a plane to go from one place to the next, you have to have a, another COVID test, and uh, which can slow down and stop your movement because if you hadn't had a, a test within the last 24 or 48 hours, they expect you to have another one. And that's been a, a challenge for us. But even in the midst of our challenges, 
God has been awesome and God has been good because during this period of time, we've seen a strong growth with our CME communities, especially in Sudan and South Sudan and Egypt. We're growing and God is just opening doors for us by leaps and bounds. We're grateful that uh, with the partnership with the Department of uh, Evangelism and Missions over in Uganda, we have started our a building process of the 175 churches that have been evangelized through our uh, mission supervisor, Joseph Watware. And we're grateful for what God is doing and he continues to do. And in Sudan, we're just thankful to God and the uh, uh, Eighth Episcopal District that we uh, built a primary school, a middle school, and a high school. And we're in the process now of building a Bible college and an orphanage for our children. And in Rwanda, on the, uh, the Bishop Teresa Jefferson Snowden Cathedral campus, uh, the government have decided that we have to build a secondary school uh, unless they would take away our property. So we're in the process of building a secondary school to, re, uh, to deal with their requirements. And uh, we're just thankful to God for all the things that he's done and the great evangelistic ministry that has taken place in the 11th Episcopal District. Wow, thank you. And to God thank be the glory. You. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Bishop Bishop Carter. Anyone else would like to chime in? Any Bishop? Okay. Dr. Well, Mason. Yes, please. Dr. Mason. Yes, Bishop uh, Williams. So that's weird. I just want us to uh, not miss, I think all of us have said it, but I just want to say it in a different way. Let us not miss how we have become more community and service oriented uh, in, in the process because, you know, I have been amazed to see not only how our churches in our Episcopal districts and so forth have fared, but I've been amazed and blessed to see how uh, as a result, I think it's safe to say of the pandemic, how we have become more community and service oriented. And I think that's true for all of the CME church. We are mindful, not just of the local church, but because of the pandemic and issues that we face, uh, we have become more, more socially conscious. Mm -hmm. And whether that is, as Bishop Reddick said, take carrying masks and passing out sanitary, uh, sanitary well, hand sanitizers, right. <laughs> passing that out, or whether it is it is being a vaccination site at our local congregations, whether it is just watching the television and becoming more socially conscious in terms of of race matters and and voting, you know, whatever the case is, I think it is safe to say the CME Church has been more socially uh, active as a result mm -hmm. of what we got. I just didn't want us to miss that. We've said it in a roundabout way, but Amen. I just wanted to put it in another context. Well, I, I Dr. Mason. Yes, Bishop Walker. Yes, I would, uh, I would uh, plug into where my colleague um, just landed. And that is to say that um, that social activism calls upon us right now in a special way to um, look at um, the 11th and the 10th Episcopal District and of course, uh, Jamaica and, and Haiti, and to think about what it means to have vaccine equity and to, um, to bring those conversations up about vaccine equity. Uh, we just, I think in the last issue of the uh, Missionary Messenger, that's what the article that I published was about. And I would say we need to look at that and we need to talk to legislators and so forth about low wealth nations and about uh, because as the booster shots come into play and I am I'm going to be one of the first in line when my turn comes. However, we need to understand what that means. That means that all of the wealthy nations will then go back and reserve even more uh, vaccine. And it means that there very well would likely be much less for uh, low wealth nations. So we need to keep this, these things in mind and we need to uh, pressure 
uh, our governments to say that there are a lot of people who are vaccine hesitant right now, uh, which is in a way uh, an expression of privilege. Um, because if we didn't have the vaccine here, we're the worst <laughs> almost in the world yeah. as it relates to COVID, uh, the presence of COVID-19 deaths and infections. And uh, so if, the, if it wasn't for the vaccine, imagine where we would be. So our hesitancy in a way is a gift of our privilege. And, uh, but at the same time, other nations don't have that gift, but they have our voice whether you're hesitant or not, and that's the great thing about it, you can advocate for vaccine equity. And that's that's another way of thinking about reopening, that as we reopen, we think because we're CME and because we don't just have roots here, but we have roots and branches, as uh, Dr. Fry Brown said yesterday, yes. and our branches are not only on US shores, but they are beyond, so as we reopen, we think about what it takes for others to reopen, and that means vaccine equity. So I would say that, and kudos to the members of the seventh. Um, just uh, so many, you know, great things are going on, and our connection that we make with each other uh, every week, and hearing about the way the hungry are being fed, and hearing about the way churches are opening up, and uh, at one time. Uh, serve the stations for vaccinations to take place for our community. Uh, it has been a blessing to hear that as as their leader. Thank God for the superlative set. Thank you. Dr. Mason? Yes. Uh, may I make one last statement? Yes, please. Uh, first of all, I must say that I've got to do what my mother taught me is to say thank you to people who make things happen for you. So let me thank you for opening this platform for the College of Bishops to be able to express our our work and the things that that's challenging us as well as moving us forward. But I want to also set the record straight. I have five conference to go. So uh, okay. we're not quite finished in the 11th district. So <laughs> keep praying for us. Right. For those of y'all that don't know how seven, 16 to 17 annual conferences to do in a, a year, uh, we just got five more to go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. If 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 I'm if I may, yes. I'm 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 observing the screen, and I just want to say a word for the bishops who are absent from the screen today, okay. that they are committed to this task as well. Yes. I know Bishop Williamson has been promoting reentry into the church buildings when possible in the first district, and he's also, as you know a strong social activist himself and he's he's done the work of reopening Collins Chapel Connectional Hospital during this COVID time. Uh, so he, he is leading really in this enterprise. I want to lift up Bishop C. James King in the fourth district. We've seen a lot of comments come across the screen from the fourth district. He is still inspiring people to reopen safely and they are doing it in the fourth. And he's successfully had the annual conferences in both Louisiana and Mississippi. Uh, Bishop Stewart has been leading as well in the ninth Episcopal district uh, where he became Bishop after the passing of Bishop Best. And they've had not their annual conferences yet, but they've had summer meetings together in each annual conference geographical area and he's going to finish with annual conferences later on in the year. And last but not least is Bishop Umoite, who though he is in Nigeria and though the epidemic or pandemic continues to grow, he's held the Ghana conference and is moving toward, I think, holding the Liberia conference within the next two months. Uh, what I'm trying to say is we are together on this effort and I appreciate the support of the whole college. If it were just one of us, if the church had a president, let me say it this way, rather than a college, I would feel a little more concerned about us, but we are much better, I think, when 11 sister and brothers come together and discuss and come to agreement than if one person were in charge. I think it's better that we are organized this way. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Senior Bishop. And let me put Bishop Umorte's image up as well. Thank uh, you, sir. And we acknowledge them. Before we get off of this and, and shift to how the church has responded to emergency, I, I want to talk a moment about how you're handling the self-care of your pastors, which tends to be a, a very important topic. Yesterday, uh, Bishop Brown, you, you certainly uh, included that uh, in your, excuse me, I'm sorry, in your address uh, and your conversation with the pastors. And so I, I'd like to hear from you all uh, about that because we know, uh, I, I'm certain you all are burned out as our leaders. I know pastors are, I know I have been just worn to a frazzle uh, at some point in time. Uh, and, and how has this impacted? you know uh your pastors you know a, a couple of weeks ago um i did a show and someone remarked that there was a mass exodus of pastors i don't know if that's true or not you know but if there are pastors that are, are leaving it, is it because they're burned out overwhelmed uh with with uh you know all that is going on so how are you bishops handling uh, your pastors and working with your pastors in this important area of, of self-care. Well, Dr. Mason, since you brought my name up on for first about this, I must admit I'm not doing enough. Um, uh, I am aware that uh, pastors, as I mentioned yesterday, that pastoring itself is a load. It is a burden, a burdensome task for anyone to do effectively. Uh, compounding that with the pandemic, uh, with all the tragedies and the trauma, not only of the virus, but of the society and the world we're living in, require more intentionality. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things I did mention on yesterday, the importance of Sabbath. Uh, uh, most of us are busy on Sunday. And so Sunday for most of us is not a Sabbath uh, in the in the biblical way of understanding that. And so I would, would encourage pastors and bishops as well, those of us who are serving in this role, uh, to find a way to take a Sabbath. But I also think that there needs to be conversation held uh, where we talk about not church, mm -hmm. but about ourselves and what we are dealing with. And I think that conversation is rarely held uh, in a way that is safe space for people to talk about what they're going through, uh, the kind of issues, the deaths of family members, the illnesses of family members. <laughs> Just spoke to a pastor yesterday about his father being ill. Um, it, it's just compounding. And uh, uh, so I think we need to do, be more intentional in, in the essence about what we do, about caring for each other and offering that for others as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Brown. Anyone else want to chime uh, in on that? Because I think to some extent it may be connected to our shift when we, we talk about the church's response to uh, catastrophes and hurricanes. I mean, some of our pastors and members are impacted by that as well on top of the virus and, and the pandemic and that kind of thing. Uh, B Bishop Williams, I think this is a great time uh, for you to share and talk a little bit about uh, the church, how the church responds to this. I know that there, there's um, been a request and for funds to support that and you know how the funds are used. Those who may not be familiar with how the CME Church uh, manages and handles uh, our members and churches that are in those areas where there's been devastation, devastation and destruction. Would you talk about that, please, sir? Yes, I will, and thank you. I am uh, uh, chair of the Emergency Relief Committee, and I want to thank uh, you not only for this opportunity to share that, but also the persons who have worked with me. We have a representative from each Episcopal district that makes up this committee, and we work together uh, to make sure that we can do whatever it is that we can to assist those persons. I don't need to tell you all that uh, when you watch the news and notice what's going on, it seems as though the number of disasters are becoming more and more uh, frequent, seemingly. 
And when we watch the television, we can see the devastation that is lost. I mean, the devastation that it leaves behind. We've just seen Ida and uh, prior to that time, there were several storms uh, that has come through. Needless to say, it wreaks havoc. We are very pleased and, and proud to be able to work with this uh, uh, relief and effort, as well as allow me to say, I'm very proud of the members of the CME Church, who every time we have made the call, have made sure that they were doing what they could to send funds in. We are aware that when things happen, it takes funds. And a lot of times we've heard how people are in need of food and, and water and clothing, and many times have been lost all. So it starts with many times us being able to have some dollars and cents to, uh, to make the effort um, to assist. So I want to thank all of the persons, all of the pastors, all of the churches, the elders, everybody, for how you generously give every time the uh, call is made. I want to share with us that the process is that when a disaster occurs in any given area, in an Episcopal area, we normally rely on the providing prelate of that area to share with us what relief efforts are needed and how they are being carried out. They also share with us what the uh, necessities are and the funds that uh, might be available, uh, or rather that is needed. We do our diligence based on what we have. We do our diligence to uh, help uh, as much as we can with as great a financial uh, assistance as we can to give as much money as we can. Uh, but normally we rely on that Episcopal uh, district, that bishop, to share with us what's going on and to help us to know how to channel those funds. And as possible, we go ahead and give it there. So right now, you are familiar with the letter that goes out on behalf of the committee. And the letter suggests and says and asks all of us, all of our churches uh, and members to give making our checks payable to the Department of Finance, sending it in to your Episcopal leader, who then will be able to record and keep up with what is given from their area. And then they forward it on to uh, the Department of Finance. Mm -hmm. And once we have an understanding of what is needed and how the bishop is uh, asking for assistance, uh, whether that is um, you know, given through an entity, an agency, or whether that is some of the ground churches and people on the ground helping. We channel the funds in that direction. And of course, we've been able to help. May I say to everybody that it's been um, um, uh, a blessing, I think, to have over the last few months, over the last few storms that we've had to show you how this is working. I don't have all the figures there before, but mm -hmm. to show you and to say that we have given probably in excess of about twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars in assistance wow. over the wow. past few months. So again, I just want to say thank you to everybody for making this happen and making it work. Now the other piece if I can say this and I don't want to take too long, but the other thing that I just want to say is that many times we wait until something happens to give. And whereas that is appreciated, we do want to encourage us to give uh, continuously so that when something happens, we'll be able to have something, some funds readily available for um, uh, an, an early or quick uh, assistance. So I just wanted to throw that out and ask everybody to please not forget to help us. But God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Bishop Williams. That is so helpful for people to know. Uh, I know people don't mind giving uh, and supporting this, but it does help to know what kind of monies you're collecting, who it's going to help uh, in that venue. So we, we certainly, uh, certainly appreciate that. Uh, we're going to shift now, uh, and we're going to uh, talk a little bit about the upcoming general conference. Uh, all roads lead to uh, Cincinnati. I'm trying to find my little banner here. Uh, on the road to Cincinnati, uh, 2022. 
before uh, we bring uh, Bishop Thomas uh, to come and talk about hosting and then Bishop Reddick uh, to come and, and talk a little bit about the uh, general conference uh, program, uh, just let me share uh, this brief clip for anyone who has never been uh, to Cincinnati. People have been talking a bit about us lately, how we work, how we play, what we create, what we enjoy. But what do all these headlines really mean for us or for you? Great question. Let us show you around. Welcome to Cincinnati. Yeah, it's a beautiful place to be. When people come to visit, they can't help but get drawn in. It helps that we've got a compact downtown area, just 15 minutes from a major airport, the best airport in the US. Cincinnati is home to 10 Fortune 500 headquarters, loads of international brands, innovative startups, and entrepreneurs. So we've got a long history of global events, successful conventions, and really great parties, which is why we've made plenty of space for them. Somewhere artistic, somewhere fancy, somewhere historic, somewhere to take your breath away. No matter your style, we've got a place to fit. And you won't even have to go far when it's finally time to hit the hay. We've got you covered with brand new hotels joining our newly renovated stunning convention hotels, high-end boutique hotels, and all of them are just steps from the convention center. And of course, you'll want a bite to eat in between the meeting and sleeping. There are dining options everywhere. New hot spots, long-lasting classics, star chefs, even our chili parlors bring their A game. Hop on the Cincinnati Bell streetcar or just take a stroll around downtown. Each district has its own unique personality. Take in a game and local brew at the banks. Connect with friends and enjoy the night. So I think I better stop right there. Uh, because I know the CMEs won't be able to take a brew and enjoy a game. <laughs> <laughs> At, at a general conference, but it sure is uh, fun to wish and think that that might be uh, the case. But Bishop Thomas, uh, tell us how the planning is coming along uh, and what can we expect. And, and then, Senior Bishop, we're going to ask you to talk a little bit about the program, the Episcopal address, the retirements, ecumenical service. Uh, we do have elections of bishops and general officers and retirement, the strategic plan, anything that you may want to share as it relates to the programmatic part. Bishop Thomas, would you please share? Thank you, uh, Dr. May. Let me, just before I do that, I, I want to um, uh, take an opportunity to, uh, to thank the College of Bishops and the CME Church for your participation and support of the NAACP Bishop William H. Gray's Memorial Membership Drive, which ended yesterday. And I just want to thank uh, all of us for, for all the ways in which we supported uh, that drive in honor of our, our late senior bishop. Well, I, I mean, the the uh, uh, I was enjoying uh, that presentation about Cincinnati, and I was like, if I didn't live here, I think I would want to come visit. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, but Cincinnati is an exciting place. I mean, uh, but let me just tell you about some of the things that the host committee has been working, and we really started a long time ago, and we have really, really been working very hard and and really excited about the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church coming to um, to uh, to Cincinnati and for the second Episcopal district where every second counts uh, to be able to serve as the host and and uh, and welcoming you to Cincinnati. One of the things that, you know, what drives us is that we want, uh, when you come to Cincinnati for the 2022 General <laughs> Conference, we want you to have an experience of a general conference unlike any you've had before. And that uh, if, if, if we can, we like to come to a place when all is said and done, that the 2022 general conference hosted by the second Episcopal district in Cincinnati, Ohio, will now become the gold standard for what general <laughs> conferences are. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, what we work, that's what we're working toward. And uh, and uh, in addition to the, the the program that the senior will talk about, let me just tell you uh, a couple of things that uh, uh, I mean. It's just a great team of of uh, of, uh, of, of, of persons from both the local areas and the connection of church working together to make this uh, this to be a tremendous a tremendous time from the planning aspect as we can do it. Uh, but a couple of things that we want to do this year, uh, this this general conference. We're gonna have a um, we're gonna have a um, a college fair, 
Um, um, and uh, I was just in a conversation, we were in a conversation, the, the, the um, Metro YMCA has a college program where they do college fairs. And every time that, in every way in which we can connect and partner with a community agency in Cincinnati to help us deliver what it is that we're seeking to deliver, uh, we will be doing that. So uh, you'll hear more about that. And then we're going to open this thing up uh, with a welcome reception mm -hmm. uh, at the um, um, Underground Railroad Center here in Cincinnati. Um, uh, it's going to be a tremendous, uh, tremendous reception, welcoming the CME Church to, uh, to, uh, to Cincinnati. We're going to have each Episcopal district will have um, um, uh, historical, uh, historic, historical exhibits um, sharing about the history of your uh, particular uh, Episcopal district. Uh, and also, uh, uh, we're going to have this major outreach project, and that is uh, receiving duffel bags and, and donations for children in foster care in the in the metro cincinnati area uh we want uh we want to be a blessing uh to this area uh not just with our dollars and cents uh, but with our hearts uh, and and letting people know that that we care and that we're thinking about them and uh this coming friday uh, registration uh, will open up for uh non-delegates and 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 visitors and for additional information, you can go to uh, www.cmegeneralconference.com. And uh, so, um, I mean, we're just excited. We're continuing to work, and uh, we will be sending periodically a uh, information sheet uh, for all the delegates and, 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 and registered uh, uh, visitors to kind of give you a sense of, of what to expect and 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 uh, uh, when you come to Cincinnati and and. Uh, Thesisly, we do have one request, and that is somewhere around the setting of the sun <laughs> on July 1st, we would not be hurt if you choose to leave. <laughs> thank you but we're excited and we're looking forward to your coming thank you very much thank you bishop we appreciate the invitation and and, and the dismissal as well bishop Reddy, will you talk uh, about what we can expect during the uh general conference please sir i'll talk about what we anticipate okay uh, i'm I'm laughing at Bishop Thomas because I wanted to say when I saw his excitement in the beginning, I hope he's just as satisfied and <laughs> glad he hosted us when we are on the way out. <laughs> uh, but but uh, our general conference program really in the end is primarily decided by a program committee mm -hmm that's comprised of delegates. And in this case, it's being led by uh, Bishop Kenneth Wayne Carter as chair and Bishop Paul Stewart as vice chair. But I know we've seen some preliminaries of what's being presented. We anticipate that the chair of the College of Bishops, Bishop James B. Walker, will be the opening preacher on Saturday morning, the 25th day of June. We anticipate that sometime that afternoon, uh, the first female elected bishop of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, Bishop Teresa Jefferson Snorton, will be giving us an Episcopal address in which all of us as members of the College of Bishops shall have participated in some way. We anticipate during this time, as you mentioned, that there will be retirement, uh, retirements of two of our bishops, and uh, there will be retirement of, we believe, three of our general officers. I cannot confirm it at the present time, but there may be retirements of judicial council members as well. And we are at a point that we want to honor those persons who have given their loyal 
service and commitment to the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Okay. Um, of course, CMEs, like most, I, w I started to say like most Black Methodists, CMEs, like most Methodists, love to come together and elect bishops. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, we will, and we anticipate the election of bishops officially. That's a decision that can only be made by the general conference. The general conference could decide to elect no more bishops. It's in their hands. But officially, though that's what the general conference has authority to do, most of the time the general conference at least fulfills the completion of the ranks if someone has died or if persons are retired. And we anticipate the election of general officers. We anticipate hearing from the strategic planning committee that has been at work since an earlier part of this quadrennium and is still at work anticipating with the Commission on Life and Witness members included, anticipating what recommendations are being made to the denomination for at least the next four years. Uh, we also always have an ecumenical service in the General Conference and we've invited one of the denominational leaders to address us during that time. And that would be the present senior bishop now of the AME Church, Bishop Adam Jefferson uh, of, uh, of what is now the 10th Episcopal District. Most of our bishops will have opportunity to address us in other services, such as Sunday morning, or in the time that we would be um, in the memorial service, or for the closing service, or we will install a new chair of the college at that time just as well. Oh, you have everybody's picture, don't you? <laughs> Bishop A.J. Richardson. Did I say Richardson or Jefferson? You said Jefferson. You said Jefferson. Thank you for correcting me. He is Adam Jefferson Richardson. Right. right. That's his name. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but he will be our preacher for the ecumenical service. I'm glad you helped me hear my mistake. But I look forward to the general conference being a time of a whole lot of business. I know Bishop Thomas wants to host us and he wants to have a lot of hosting ventures, but I hope those of all colors who are elected delegates will come to work from sunup to sundown and beyond to make sure that we get the agenda done before we say goodbye on the first day of July. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bishop. I appreciate that. And we are indeed excited uh, to head to Cincinnati. Uh, would you all Dr. listen? Bishop. Yes, uh, Bishop. Someone asked about um, protocols. And I was about to mention that. Yes, all sir. of those things are going to be in place. And, okay. and uh, that information will be will be disseminated uh, in advance. In advance. Okay. So we know that one of the joyful highlights of the general conference, of course, is the sharing of resolutions and the reading of them and going through them. And, and so uh, Bishop Jefferson Snorton, would you come now and talk a little bit about the process uh, for submitting resolutions, please? Yes, uh, earlier this month, uh, those who are receiving information through CME Church Communications receive the details about how to submit a resolution. Any uh, member in good standing in the CME Church can submit a resolution for consideration by the General Conference. However, they do have to be in a specific format and they do have to reference which section of the Book of Discipline they are to be considered for. Uh, your resolution needs to be submitted to your representative from your Episcopal District on the committee on resolutions. That committee has already been appointed and their names were uh, included in the CME Church Communications email and it is also published in the Christian Index starting with the September issue. 
we will be receiving resolutions between September 1st and January 31st of 2022. Any resolutions received after that deadline will not be able to be considered. If you are thinking about a resolution, I encourage you to submit it early in case you need to make some revisions to it. You can mail or email your Episcopal District representative. And if for some reason it is not in the proper format, they will return it to you uh, with instructions on how to format it properly and get it back in time to be considered before that January 31st deadline. Sometime in the month of May, the delegates will receive the entire book of resolutions so that when the general conference is convened, uh, specific resolutions will be going to specific committees of the general conference for consideration. So we do want to encourage everyone uh, to submit resolutions that they feel may be pertinent or germane to our book of discipline, but do uh, be aware that the resolution is intended to be something that goes in the book of discipline and not just a good idea that you have about something that the church ought to be doing. Uh, the book of discipline is that book that governs us. It tells us how we operate and um, we don't want people to feel like things are being overlooked, but if it's not appropriate for the book of discipline, there's no way for it to be included. So if you have questions, please talk to your Episcopal district representative. If you don't know who that is, ask your providing bishop, but that information uh, is on the SUNY Church website as well as in the Christian Index. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me also just acknowledge, they're not on, but certainly want to acknowledge Bishop Marshall Gilmore uh, and Mrs. Gilmore. Uh, and Bishop Otho Hawthorne Lakey. Um, what, one of the things about uh, Bishop Lakey, uh, Bishop and Bishop Brown, is that he watches, he tunes in. Sometimes I can't see him. And if somebody says something that raises an ire, he'll email me. <laughs> he'll email me and we'll have a conversation <laughs> about that. But I'm appreciative to, to the, the two of them for uh, watching and being engaged and to all of the people as well who are watching. So what I'd like to do, you've been so generous with your time. We are almost at the conclusion of this session. Uh, and Bishop Williamson called, uh, and I'm going to try to get him on speakerphone uh, so that he can close us out. But I like to close uh, each uh, show with matters of the heart. And, and really what it does, it just gives people who are on an opportunity to share maybe what's on their heart about our church, uh, about our, our ministry. A couple of weeks ago, I had the, it was an honor to interview uh, four of our pastors who served in Afghanistan. Um, and I tell you, um, I've done a number of shows, uh, some very spirited and, and, and excitable, but this one hit me in a whole different way. Uh, because we don't know what pastors have been through, lay as well, um, and the things that have impacted them, uh, and to listen to my colleagues in the ministry talk about their PTSD that they're still experiencing, yet trying to minister God's people, I thought was um, just uh, riveting for me. So I want each of you just to kind of share your final closing thoughts uh, in terms of those things that are on your heart about our church, the, the upcoming uh, general conference uh, and anything else that you feel would like to share in this moment. Uh, and then by that point, hopefully I'll have Bishop Williamson on the line uh, and we will uh, hear from him. Bishop um, Thomas, I'd like to begin with you, please, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank you for, for this time that uh, you've had us on and, and for this conversation. And for the uh, for the uh, comments from the persons across the church, and as it relates to their appreciativeness for for this time that we're sharing together, and 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 I just simply want to uh, to say to uh, all of our pastors and and lay persons across uh, the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, the same thing that I say to uh, the the pastors, the clergy, and the lay persons in the Second Episcopal District 
every time we come together. And that is, I just thank God for you. I thank God for you because uh, you keep showing up. You keep showing up in the midst of a pandemic. You keep showing up. And so I just pray God's blessings upon you as you continue to keep showing up. For if you show up, that's half the battle. God bless you and, and thank you. And God bless the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. You're muted, Dr. Skip. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bishop Thomas. Uh, to my bishop, Bishop Thomas L. Brown, would you, you share your closing thought, please, sir? Dr. Mason and certainly to my colleagues, I uh, want to um, take this privilege, first of all, to thank you for the ministry you are performing for our church via this vehicle. Uh, and I marvel each time I watch you how you've got everything so readily at a, at a point of a button or whatever you do to make it happen. Uh, it, it, you are a marvel at what you do. Uh, and we in the sixth district are proud of you and the leadership that you give us, the West Mission Street Church, uh, and all of the good people of the sixth district. Um, I, I would cast my closing remarks in the light of the fact that we have just celebrated 20 years of 9 11 uh, and the end of a war in Afghanistan, 20 years. Uh, and in some ways, it may be providential, but the College of Bishops, at least uh, represented by us, are here this afternoon sharing, as someone posted earlier, good news about the church. Uh, I, I think when all is said and done, uh, our faith does matter. I, I'm reminded of uh, what my wife and I, Dr. Louise, are learning from our gardening using pot plants. Uh, we now have okra that we are still gleaning from. But I've, I've learned, we learned again, and perhaps I should say, that plants need sunlight, water, and nutrients to keep on bearing fruit. The same is true for the church, that we are rooted in faith. And in order for us to continue to thrive and be resilient in our faith, we need some <coughs> sunlight. We need to make sure that we're rooted and grounded in the faith and that there is nurture taking place. And in light of that, I'm excited about what's going on in the church because if the key, if the scriptures are correct about what the kingdom of God is like, then indeed a whole lot is happening that we do not even see at this juncture. And so I pray God's blessings upon you, sir, and upon each of us and this church of ours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop Brown. Bishop Walker, would you give us your closing thoughts, matters on your heart, please, sir? Uh, sure. Um, and thank you again, as everyone has said, I did all those words of appreciation and admiration for what you do it is in high esteem in my book. Um, in terms of what's on my heart, I guess the first thing that I would say is, well, what I would say is this matter of reopening is emblematic of what the church means to us and how we see the CME church. Um, it represents hope in our community. And uh, to see the doors open again um, where they have been closed, because some of you have never closed, but to see those doors open again where they have been closed um, says something to the communities in which we're in, something positive, and it sends that message. And that says to me who we are as congregations. And I'm thankful to God for he has given us the opportunity to serve. And the service of the CME Church matters because what we do touches lives in ways that others might not. Whereas one church might be, a nice Baptist church on the corner, might be concerned about their roof and their walls and so forth. There is in the CME Church a higher arc in terms of vision. We kind of see the nation, I believe, with clearer eyes. And I believe we see the world with a better sense of, uh, for our heart and mind. And so our, our work touches colleges, touches everything. And so I would just say again, that we represent hope 
And that's what's on my mind right now, uh, seeing that hope enlivened again in some of our facilities and seeing plans made in others. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bishop Walker. Uh, Bishop Jefferson Snorton, uh, let me thank you for your tremendous help in coordinating it. I need to hire her as the co-producer. Uh, <laughs> it would work. Trust me on that. <laughs> but, but thank you so much. Um, please share matters on your heart um, at this time, please. Oh, thank you, Dr. Mason. It's always a delight to work with you. Uh, and I, I definitely enjoy this platform that you have put together for the church. It, it really has been a gift to us. Uh, I want to follow up with uh, that theme that Bishop Walker ended with, and that's hope. Uh, someone once told me uh, when I was kind of in a state of, oh, well, what's the point, to always look for signs of hope. And that, that would be what's in my heart today. No matter what's happening all around us, uh, no matter what it looks like, what are the signs of hope? Because I know we believe in a God of hope. Last Sunday, uh, as my husband and I were returning from Florida, from uh, funeralizing his mother, uh, it, it occurred to him that he had to do worship service for the church that he's currently pastoring. And so uh, when it came time, they've been doing their worship service by conference call. When it came time, uh, he found a spot and pulled off the side of the road and said, I think we'll do church here. When I looked up, we were at Big Rosie's fruit stand. And I thought, well, this is an interesting spot. <laughs> but uh, my husband proceeded to turn the trunk of the car into the communion uh, table and proceeded to have worship at Big Rosie's fruit stand. The two gentlemen that were working at the fruit stand were standing far off, but I saw them drawing closer and closer as the service proceeded that included music from their musician and, and the preaching. Uh, other people who came to the fruit stand would stop and listen to what was happening. And for me, it was one of those really sacred, holy moments where I came to see a sign of hope that neither time nor space, pandemic, disruption, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that's our hope. And if we can just cling to that hope, we can know that no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what circumstances we are in, we are strong because we are God's church, a church of hope and a church of promise. Amen. 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 Beautiful. Thank you. Bishop Kenneth Carter, would you please share the matters on your heart and give us your closing thoughts? Please, Thank sir. you very much again, Dr. Skip, for this platform and for the College of Bishops as we speak in one voice for the church and also for those who are listening to us. What's on my heart is that in the past couple of weeks, I've had the opportunity to witness the awesome glimpse of our future with our young adults in the College of Bishops and CNBC partnering together with COVID-19 as well as our youth with the five, I mean the 5G back to school explosion. That experience, those two experiences together said to me that God is still at work. Future is going to be brighter than our past. Amen. Amen, Bishop Carter. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Bishop Williams, would you please share matters of your heart and your closing thoughts, please, sir? That would be true. The first will be uh, a scripture that reminds us, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for we shall reap if we faint not. The church, I pray, will continue to serve. The second thing that I thought about is that amidst all of the concerns that we have, and put forth in the church, and some people would even dare say, what is wrong with the church? I share with you a quote that I heard and learned a long time ago, and it simply says, there is no problem that cannot be solved as long as the problem solvers don't become the problem to be solved. 
<laughs> Bishop Williams, I will quote you the first time and then the second time it's mine. That was beautiful. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and now, Senior Bishop, would you please uh, give us your closing thoughts and math uh, on your I, answer? I will try, but if he were not my Alabama born friend, I would think I was just set up. <laughs> but uh, my heart, my heart is at the place of believing something I was told actually when I first became editor. Now that was a long time ago and I'm not gonna give the years. Somebody else might need to look it up. But I had been editor about three months and a family member wrote me and said, Larry, you keep talking about political problems. The problems of the CME church are not political. They are spiritual. <laughs> that was an eye opener. And the fact that I'm remembering it this much later tells what an impact it made on me. So I'm going to say that what's on my heart is that we as bishops are first and foremost chief pastors. We are pastors to our pastors and to the churches and people of the denomination. Uh, I missed you yesterday, Dr. Mason, from the presentation of archives and history, which you know I was a part of our planning for. But I had to make a decision in the last few days as to whether I would be present on that Zoom at all hours or whether I would be the pastor for a former pastor, presiding elder, former general officer who was burying his wife of 60 years. Sometimes we have to make those choices. We are pastors. And I think when I heard my colleagues today talking about what they may be doing or need to do in terms of our pastors and their needs during this pandemic. We have some people who are hurting. I hear Bishop Jefferson snorting, talking about their fatigue. I hear the uh, stress syndrome that you have raised to us. I hear Bishop Brown saying he is not doing enough in this area. And I must tell you, Bishop Brown, I'm really modeling what I'm trying to do a lot after what I've heard you are doing. Because I think it is time to make sure all of our pastors observe a Sabbath other than Sunday. Because if we think God needs us every day of the week or God's work cannot get done, then we must think God is not true because God rested on the Sabbath. Amen. I think we have to encourage people to be in prayer. When the pandemic was beginning, I was coming out of surgery from on, on my vocal cords and in the silence of what had been requested of me. I kept tuning in to the morning connectional prayer ministry. I'm still tuning in because it gives me so much strength. Our problems are primarily spiritual. Uh, we need to read and study and reflect more. When I when I hear Thomas, uh, that is Bishop Marvin Thomas and Bishop Thomas Brown talking about the books they are reading, and I'm wondering if if I know what reading is again because they're talking about books I've got to go find. I'm learning more and more that we have to teach our leaders to read and reflect and share. And finally, what's on my heart is still in this same business as a chief pastor. We've got to take care of our families. For the last thing we need to do is to die and our family be bitter because of what we as bishops or general officers or pastors or leaders of the church in our congregations, bitter because we gave the church our attention and did not give it to our family. Those things are on my heart. And thank you for an opportunity to share.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Senior Bishop. And let me thank each of you. Beautiful words to reflect on. I hope you'll get an opportunity at some point and view the wonderful comments uh, that I have not been able to post so many of them but people who have been engaged uh, this afternoon. And I'm grateful for each Sunday for this uh, opportunity uh, to come. Let me acknowledge your spouses as well. Uh, and again, thank you so much. Uh, and Dr. Duhart, I owe you lunch at the general conference, but I know you won't have time to eat uh, at any rate, but I do owe you That was low. <laughs> <laughs> But I owe her lunch, okay? So what we're going to try to do is to see, I have Bishop Henry Williamson, the presiding prelate of the first of the first Episcopal district on the line. He is going to uh, close us out uh, today. Bishop, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, now can you all hear Bishop? We yes. can. Dr. Mason, okay. can I just say a quick word? Yes, before hold on prays? one second, Bishop yes. Williamson. Yes, Bishop. Yes, yes. I, I just want to uh, take this opportunity and use this platform to thank the members of the Connectional Church who have been so kind to my husband and to the Jefferson family with the passing of Mother Jefferson. We have heard from so many CMEs with cards and phone calls and expressions, and it's just great to be a part of a CME Church family as Bishop Reddick described us, the family really has ministered to our family during this season of grief, and we are grateful. Amen. Thank you, and I'll continue prayers to you uh, and presiding uh, Elder Lawrence as well. Bishop Williamson, we're going to try this technology. Go right ahead, and hopefully everybody can hear you. Thank you, Dr. Speaker. Thank you to my colleagues, colleagues, especially our senior I am so grateful for the kind of beautiful dialogue. I'm so grateful for the college of mission with a statement of how we can safely open our churches. And a new norm is in place, virtual, and then hybrid, and we have all together.
but only after you have done your study and preparation and move forward. So I'm very grateful for all that has been said and the collective vision of our bishops with our presiding elders and general officers, we should be moving forward to make sure that our churches are open and our churches are sharing and our churches are winning souls. This time, people want the answer to what's going on? What on earth am I here for? What is God doing? And as we look to the Lord, hear from him and look to the good examples of many of our churches that are open safely and sharing the message of God's love, we can be a growing church in the midst of the pandemic and the plague. I am very thankful for the courageous pastors, both men and women, who have safely opened their churches and safely open to the community the opportunities to worship, witness, and work. We are very thankful. And I say to the church, be encouraged. Be encouraged. God is making a way, and he's answered our prayer. We pray for there to be a vaccine, and God answered. And now we have to pray and act and instruct and educate so people will take advantage and be obedient to science and the answer that God sent a vaccine. And we know now people with the vaccine do not get COVID-19. If they do, the symptoms are such that they are healed and they recover in a very timely manner. So I'm grateful that all we need collectively, and we've heard it, bless all of these wonderful bishops and leaders, the vision to see, the faith to believe, and the courage to do. In Jesus' mighty name, God bless, and thank you for providing this format for us, Reverend Dr. Skip Mason. Thank you so much. God bless you, Bishop Williamson. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait, Wait in the water. In the water. When God's gonna, gonna trouble. trouble. Yeah, 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 I see it looks 
like my people And they're coming on, coming on through Well, my God's gonna, gonna trouble, trouble the water Well, everybody goes away Well, everybody goes away Oh, oh, oh.